leadership. Get leaders leading for safety. Employee engagement. Get the guys working on the things that are important to them in the way that they want to do. And you do it within a safety partnership. Right. So it's a partnership between the employees and the leaders. It's not one or the other. Leaders control resources. The guys control what's done. Well, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad that you're here with us. And for those of you who are tuning in, we're talking to Dom Cooper. And Dom is the CEO of Be Safe Management Solutions. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I'm a former tradesman. I was a soldier when I first, I was 17 when I signed on. And then I came out of the military. I was in the Corps of Engineers. So the obvious thing is to do something in construction. Yep. Um, so I'm an advanced scaffolder by trade. So I literally worked on the tool, shifting 20 tonne of steel every single day for 10 years or so. Right. So um, you were you were like myself in on the ground, boots on the ground, where the oh, rubber absolutely. hits the road when absolutely. you started. Great, great. Yeah. I know that um, you know, we were just talking a little bit about how Zoom and using the technology are having is maybe kind of disrupting um how we typically um might cultivate the culture in the workplace that we're we're looking to do. And I know that you and I um, in the green room, we were talking a little bit about, you know, whether or not safety culture was even a thing. And I promise that I, I'd open that up here for discussion, right? Because uh, I, I am interested in somebody like yourself who has been boots on the ground, right? And then you hear all these kind of different academic ideas like safety culture and and all those things coming out. What are your thoughts, Dom? Like, do you think this is helpful for us as professionals or is it straying us away from what we need to focus on? I guess that's my first question to you. Okay, so let me make it clear. I'm also an academic. I was a professor yep. of safety at Indiana University in Bloomington and a visiting professor in industrial organizational psychology. My degrees are industrial organizational psychology. So when I came to safety culture, it was in the, the late 1980s. Chernobyl had happened. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting. So before Chernobyl, we had Bhopal. So Bhopal, yeah. uh, that's where the, the term safety culture or a culture of safety was kind of brought to the fore. And it was basically saying that the country didn't have uh, a culture of safety because it was India. Uh, so it was a, a, a third world country versus a first world country. Yeah. So then we had um, Chernobyl and then we, the IAEA and the NRC and everyone began talking about this safety culture, which is a shorthand term for culture of safety, because we all like to be very efficient. So we kind of just use pat terms. So mm -hmm. actually, when we talk about safety culture, we're talking about a culture of safety. OK, OK. Now that you're explaining that, that makes sense to me. You can right. have a culture of safety yes right. so, inside your organizational overarching culture am right. i on board yes you are okay. exactly okay that, that's, that's exactly it. it's a culture of safety what okay uh, i you've yeah, actually um, converted me a little bit here go on okay so what emphasis <laughs> you put on safety in an organization now at the time i was transitioning from being a scaffolder to being an academic so i was doing my phd looking at construction safety Uh huh. And my professor, I was at UMIST in Manchester University in Britain, and my professor, who's in the psychology department, um, was talking to me about Albert Jan Bandura's work, about this reciprocal relationships between things. And it wasn't a part of my PhD, particularly. I was doing does behavioral, uh, behavioral safety or behavior-based safety work in the construction industry, which we yeah. proved it did. Um, but... Uh, it was something that was there. So as we went through, part of that work was, well, let's do a safety climate survey. So I reached out to Dov Zohar in Israel, who was the, um, he was the, the, the first person to ever do safety climate surveys in 1980. So he sent us a copy of a Hebrew version. So we wrote mm -hmm. back, oh, and he called me a girl, which is Chris Dominique instead of Dominique. So yep. I kind of wrote back and says, hey, so thank you, Dov, um, really nice, but can we have an English version? By the way, I'm a bloke. So, 
um, anyway, he very kindly did, and I will be forever grateful to Dom Zoha for doing so. So then we got into looking at safety climate. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. safety climate is a sub-feature of safety culture or culture of safety. Okay? Yeah. So yeah. it's the climate for safety at that particular moment in time. It's about okay. perceptions. So climate surveys and safety surveys are measuring perceptions. So when you think of my PhD, so I was working perceptions on... of safety or perceptions of risk, just to... of safety, the way okay. safety is operational. Okay. So I was already working on this this thing of the relationship between mind and what we think about safety, and then what we do in safety. A the behavioural safety, the, the safety behaviour. So it wasn't too much of a stretch to then think, well, actually, we've got a situation. So one, for example, we had we, we matched all the experimental sites. And um, for example, we had uh, a managing director and his crew visit one of the sites. Mm -hmm. And because we were monitoring we were, the, the guys on the, the project, were, we saw this huge spike in the improvement in safety. And we says, well, how did that work? Oh, the managing director visited. Oh, OK, right. So there's the impact of a change in situation, which is now impacting what people do. Right, yeah. right. Because when the managing director came, just being from frontline myself, what happens on the front line is everybody scurries around to make sure everything is absolutely pristinely perfect. All right. signs are up. Everything is totally, you know, picture perfect. Um, so that when that entourage of the seniors come in, there's nothing to nitpick. Exactly. And they yeah, always take, that makes they always sense. Take, they always take them around the royal room. So everything oh, yes. is hidden in the closets and the cupboards, but they don't get to open the closets and the cupboards. And they don't they don't let them speak to the employees. Now that's a discussion for another time. I hear you, but right. continue on. So so anyway, so my professor Ivan, Ivan Robertson, um, yeah. he he was always talking about, you know, Bandura's model reciprocal determinism, social learning theory, social cognitive theory, and all of these different theories. So I looked at it, and during, I finished my PhD in 92, and by 98, had put together a theory of towards a model of safety culture. So I began to model a culture of safety. How does this work? Yeah, yeah. And for me, my bent, as it always has been in safety, is how useful is this to the guys on the construction sites that I used to work with? Nice. Is it going to save their life? Is it going to do anything for them? If it doesn't, it, the whole thing's redundant and we get rid of it. We move on and we find How's something. it going to move the needle? Right, exactly. The real needle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I put this thing together and said, well, you know, if you want to measure a situation, you have a thing called a safety management system and the safety management system audit. Oh, hey, look, we can look at the safety management system because that's looking at the situation. So yeah, they're yeah. injunctive norms. They tell us what we ought to be doing, all the roles, the rules, the guides, the procedures, safety guidelines, if you like. They're all there yeah. in that, that system. Well, OK, so then we have the behaviour, what people do in certain situations. So I can remember when I was a scaffolder, I was not the safest scaffolder on the block, but I was on piecework. I earned money. Mm -hmm. I needed to earn money. And I would balance on a two-inch two tube and carry in a 21-foot tube and put it on top of another one, empty. And it was what you did. Was it safe? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah, but it's what you did. It's how the job was done. But was your perception that it was unsafe? Uh, my perception was that I'm going to make sure my feet are solidly on this tube and solidly on that tube because I don't right. want to go flying over the side. Right. And so you in your perception, you were being safe. Right. And you right. hooked okay. the leg you hook your leg around the, the scarf, as it were, and yep. then you just feed the tube up and you put it on top and you do up the spigot and then off you go the next. Yep. So you're kind of doing these things. And you can be two or 300 foot in the air doing this. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So really, then you're looking at the, the reaction. Well, okay, how does that work? Then you look at well, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? So hearts and minds show up, hearts and minds campaign, those kinds. Of mm -hmm, so we put mm -hmm. this together into this model so that we can begin to quantify safety culture okay so then at the same time ironically uh frank goldemond who was a i think he was at delft university in holland um he would release the model and i met him in san francisco at a conference and he was talking about edgar shine and his model of safety culture okay? yeah yeah so my my approach is what we would call functionalist and norm-based so it's norms we have 
social norms which guides the psychology of what we're thinking and doing. Yeah, we yeah. have behavioural norms because this is how you behave in this situation, doing yeah. this task at this moment in time. And then we have the systems that have been developed and the structures put in place that facilitate us working safely or whatever. So you've got those three things. So then we go to the other model, which is Shine's model of organizational culture. Now, I will say before I kind of go down this track, that this particular track, the interpretive approach is what they call it, goes back to Weber and the sociologists of 1905, looking yeah. at organizational culture and the sociology of industry. So that was how all of these kind of things, came. they go back a long, 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 long way. And then you've got Hofstetter and then you've got Shine, all these people looking at organizational culture rather than national cultures. So you've got ethnographics, you've got sociologists, you've got psychologists, behaviorists, organizational psychology. Everyone's from different disciplines, different lens and looking at this thing. So Frank's come up with his model based on Shine, which is at the top layer of it's a pyramid, like Heinrich trying. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So we have artifacts, symbols, posters, high visi vests, um, all of the kind of visible things that you can see around safety. And then underneath that, you have these espoused values or whatever, which is what they use. They use safety climate surveys, like I discussed when I was doing my PhD. Yeah, yeah. They use surveys to actually find out what people's perceptions are. But then below that, we have the base of what they say is culture, which is people's invisible, unknown, yeah. taken for granted assumptions. That's right. Yeah. And beliefs. So, Right. So yeah. to change culture, we have to change these invisible, unknown, taken for granted assumptions. Yeah. Nobody knows what they are, not even the people who possess them. No, they yeah. don't. Yeah. Right. I, and I'm glad you brought this up because I have a social work background. OK. OK. And so ex um, I talk a lot about group dynamics uh -huh. and it, it, it astounds me how People are talking about safety culture. I prefer actually the way you're terming it, a, a culture of safety uh -huh. and organizational culture. But uh -huh. in all of these conversations, Dom, they don't talk about group dynamics. Exactly. But culture is a group phenomenon. Yes, it is. It's not an individual thing. Mm -hmm. So if I change your mind, if I change the culture, has anything changed in your house or your office? Diddly squat. Right. Not unless you're not unless it's impacting me on such a deep level of my beliefs and values. And but that's why I also struggle with organizational culture in a way that people say, well, it, 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 it's all about the senior leadership. I'm like, is it really, though? Because uh, no, uh, that yeah. social uh, in my perception, OK, the senior leadership influences the front line when they come to visit because most people don't want to lose their jobs, right? So they, okay. they have influence. I agree about the influence piece, but do they really have um, are, do they really have the ability to change people's values and belief at the deepest core, right? In Does it place? matter? It's question one. Does it matter? I'll, are you paid? I, are you paid for your beliefs and your values? The answer no. is no. No. You're paid yes. to do things, to produce right. things, whether it's be creative or whether it's manufacture something or make something or whatever. That's you're, I can agree with that because you're renting my time. Yeah, I did yeah. I do every organization I've ever worked for, I've never sold them or hired them my values my belief systems because they come from my grandmother they come from me as a baby sitting on the knees of my parents and in my village and yeah. all the people around yeah. me I'm not selling those and it's a nonsense to even think that you are or anyone else is so it's it, it so back to the first question is all this deviating from where we should really be focusing right which is on what do we do and in what circumstances do we do it what's the right. context of that so going back to your comments about the, the board in yes. my experience I, I used to think exactly the same as you someone says to me they're a manager I would spit on the ground <laughs> not interested <laughs> absolutely not I've interested. seen people do that I haven't been one of them but I, I I've seen and, other workers 
but as I've gone additive. through this transition from yes. a, a, a guy on the tools to working the way through and now advising companies on safety, I've seen that the board members are as committed to safety as the guys on the floor. Okay, great. The problem is everyone in between and the system uh, yeah. and all the power relationships and so on and so forth. So there's all of these things. Now, if you can get your board members to risk assess their exposure to mm -hmm. certain fundamental safety culture attributes of which research has shown us over the last three decades, yeah. so the two social norms fundamentals would be profit, putting profit before safety and creating a culture of fear. Okay. Okay. In terms of behavior, you would have leadership in terms of responsibility, accountability, freedom to act, and knowledge of the safety management systems and managerial compliance. So, managerial non compliance has been proven by numerous bodies to be responsible for 80% of all our industrial disasters. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then we've got situation elements. We talk about communication systems, not just communicating like we are now, but the systems that are in place to make sure communications are two way and they go up and down the organization horizontally and, and vertically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Then we have competence. What about the competence of the people that we're employing and putting into safety critical situations? So we yes. have functional competence, we have cognitive competence. And we have uh, enabling competencies, so the softer skills, if you like. Okay, yep, yep. And then we have uh, the lessons learned process. How does that work? And so on. So, what you want the board to do is risk assess their organization's exposure to each of those things, take okay, them as individual yeah. topics or whatever. It's what assessments do, find out where and what you need to work on. So, you do that, then the board's on board, and they need to do that because they've got to resource it. They've got to give the direct strategic direction. Yeah. So, many, many companies don't have a strategy for improving safety culture. And this is where the interpretive approach does safety a disservice. Okay. Okay. Because it says, and its fundamental ethos is, well, oh, culture emerges from all these interactions. So therefore, you can't develop a strategy. You cannot engineer a culture of safety, which is absolute nonsense. Of course no, you can. can engineer it. Of course you can. Yeah. You yeah. engineer a, a, a culture of quality. You can engineer a culture of productivity. You can engineer anything you want in the world, right? If you're paying, you're paying yeah. people to do what you want them to do. But that just means that you have a little bit more people management and system sure. management, right? You have but to manage those line. group dynamics that we were just talking about, making yeah. sure that the the behaviors, the, the expected behaviors are being done consistently throughout all teams, right? Mm -hmm. And that you're, you're not having informal leaders show up, deviating from what you would like people to do and having them influence that, oh, we can just do it this way. Right. You know, which... and that's exactly right. I mean, we worked these things I've just talked about, these safety culture attributes. And why am I saying there is something in this? Because in 2016, I think it was published, the work was published in 2018 in Safety Science. Yeah. We actually did this, but we used a, a hybrid between the interpretive and the quantitative approach. Okay. The yeah, okay. Approach. We use both. So we used a, an interpretive tool, but quantified or got the guys to quantify on a rating scale, okay? We took their ratings on all of these attributes I've just talked about, like yeah. the cultural fear and the profit for safety and so on. And then we correlated the results from that against a basket of uh, lagging indicators that the company already monitored and measured, okay? So we had to work out the reliability of the measure and the reliability of the incident statistics, which can be done statistically. Because uh, if, if either of those tools are or yeah tools are unreliable, then yeah. the correlation gets suppressed. The more reliable they are, then the higher the correlation, the validity coefficient. Yeah. So yeah. we were looking for concurrent validity. Does this tell us, and can it distinguish between or discriminate between various parts of the organisations that tell us that this tool 
that the, the, if it's a good rating, they've got a low incident rate. Or if it's a bad rating, they got a high incident. And lo and behold, we were getting, I mean, we're using multiple regression. We were getting numbers 0.45, which is unheard of. It's massive. The, the, put it this way. The U.S. Department of Labor says anything that's over 0.35 is absolutely fantastic and well worth the while getting. We got them to four or five. So there is a relationship. And what we did find out was culture of fear, a culture of fear loaded on seven of them. So the first thing, one of the first things, the priorities for that organization was to reduce the culture of fear. That was where you would go to. So just now, cultures, blame cultures, blah, blah, yeah. blah. So I want to stick with that for a little bit, the culture of fear, the blame culture. And uh, for our listeners, I'm sure that this is something that they have been challenged and struggling trying to navigate through. In your experiences, Dom, um, what are, would you suggest some insights on how to navigate through and repair a culture of fear? I know I, in, that's a hard one, and I know yeah, it wasn't on it, our list of topics, but it's an interesting one. Um, first of all, I mean, uh, let me place some context into it. So, in the interpretive approach that's coming through now, there is an awful lot of stuff that is just destroying safety. It's insidious. It's like a poison, toxic poison that's running through safety. So, this morning, for example, I was listening to a very famous professor um, in the New View camp. Um, who was telling us um, that monitoring accident statistics is dehumanizing. I'm like, what? It's dehumanizing. I say, well, isn't it more dehumanizing to ignore people getting hurt? You know? So another part of what we're getting is um, systems and the environment dictate behavior. There is no, you cannot blame an individual, which is how I'm obliquely answering your question. You cannot blame individuals you cannot put hold people to account because it's always something wrong in the system so i say well okay i'm driving a forklift i have to stop at a, 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 a traffic light or a stop sign and I say, i'm on a t-junction so i'm going from a minor road into a major road where we got semi trucks coming through okay and it's in a facility and you can't change the, the layout of the place because Historically, it's just grown ad hoc. Blah, 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 blah. So the stop sign comes along, but the guy doesn't stop. He goes straight out. Now, according to the people, and I've done this on LinkedIn, and people tell me, no, it must be the design of the forklift. It must be the way that the management are. It must be this, that, and the other. But the bloke's not at fault. Well, excuse me, he's exactly at fault. Because if he's not at fault, then that means that everybody on the roads, all the road traffic accidents can carry on going ahead. Doesn't matter. Don't worry about the rules and the guidelines. Do what you want because it's the system's fault. So all of these people are not recognizing that people make choices. When we look at human error, there's three parts of it. There's failures in planning, okay? Knowledge and rule-based mistakes, if you like, in reason. Yeah. There's failures in execution memory failures, distractions, thrill-seeking, and so on and so forth, those kind of things. They're generally inadvertent uh, and unintended um, outcomes of a particular set of activities. But then we've got behavioral choices. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we choose to take a shortcut, do we not? Yep. We choose to engage in thrill-seeking, do we not? We choose to overcome organizational problems. So we have this stop-the-job thing. Um, so when I was in the military, for example, I was in the north of Ireland as a soldier. Yeah. And we, ha we had to build a, a, a wall. And we did the groundworks, laid the concrete and so on. I was the only one in the, in the troop who knew, or in the section, who knew how to use a cement mixer because I used to do it on leave because I got paid some poor wages. I ran out of money on the first night on my leave. So I would then go and work on the construction site. Well, so we did this with a cement mixer. And whatnot. We came back few days later after it had gone off to lay the blocks and my corporal said to me oh uh, knock us up a mix for laying blocks and I looked around and I said where's the sand I said I've got aggregate sand for laying concrete but I don't have any sharp sand for making water oh um, use your sapper initiative get a brickage trowel 
dig it in, throw the, the, the stones out, throw it in the machine, knock up a mix. When it comes out and we get it, as we're laying the blocks, we'll take other stones out. I did that and I got my combat jacket sleeve caught on the cut and I got pulled into the machine and my arm was nearly ripped off and 18 months in military hospital. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, but I could have said, no, stop the job. Oh, I mean, it's in the arm. It's slightly different. You say no yeah. to an officer, but you can go to jail, you know? Right, yeah, so yeah. That would, that would be a classic stop the job situation, which I didn't, okay? So do people... And there were reasons that? why you didn't. Yeah, we were on active service for one. Yeah, <laughs> but, but that's my point, is that you you made a made a decision to can you to go on however it's not so black and white it's not so clear cut right. there that goes back to the group dynamics the group that you were in what is the normative expectations exactly. it was that you listen to what you're told and you do it you don't right. question right but my point again is we make choices we yep. make choices for whatever reasons we made those choices i could both of you team. made choices yeah, I could. You I made could them take. Yeah. Ultimately, it was my responsibility. Yeah. Because I should have just said no. I, I was known for saying no when I would. I, I can be stubborn when I want. <laughs> so I should Fair have enough. just said, no, but I didn't. Okay. And I've heard since there's two or three equivalent scenarios that have happened to other sappers. You know, it, it's one of these things. So, but my point is, we as people can change the situation. So, for mm -hmm. example. Yesterday I was reading five people have been killed because somebody ran a red light while drunk and T-boned them. Okay? Right. Yeah. Here in America. Well, the guy made the choice to drink while to drive while drinking. Yeah. The guy made the choice to run the red light. Do we blame the situation? What situation are we blaming it? What system are we blaming? Was he grown up poor? Who cares? I grew up poor. I used to live on the streets. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. And and to be to your point, you know, they're over here in North America, you know, Kat, Candace uh, Lightning, um, who developed the MAD, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, she wow. really wants to even remove the word accident when it okay. comes to drinking and driving. And her point is, is that the person, exactly what you're saying, the person made a choice to drink. The person made a choice to get behind the wheel. It is not an accident that they exactly. then hit somebody because we already know that there's a high probability that if you're drinking, you you don't have the same focus and you could um, hit and kill either yourself or somebody else. That's exactly right. And right. that's what we're all in this for. It's about yeah. serious injuries and fatalities and so on. But, and she's right. And, and I think it was the... The medical institute in britain anyway they don't use the word accident they use the word incident yeah accident. that's what she's saying too yeah in, yeah in something. And, and okay so let me dig into so, that okay yeah. go ahead and then i'm going to come back yeah, to you. i was just going to say go now back to this just culture and this culture of fear yeah so you've got a blame culture so this this culture of fear is separate from a just culture and blame culture and we talk about amy edmondson's psychological safety speaking up well pfft, I've known people to speak up when I was working and get sacked instantly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Psychological yeah. and everything these days is anything to do with communication now is psychological safety. So that everyone's taking these constructs and bending them and using them in lots of different ways that they weren't originally intended to be used. Yeah. yeah. Ian Conchie and, and Ian Donald, they, they did a lot of work on this in 2008 before Decker got there with his restorative giant stuff and all the rest of it. Yeah. So this stuff's been around for years. How do you create a just culture? I think Patrick Hudson and Rames Reason put together some kind of decision tree and people knock it, but at least it says, well, you know, are you really culpable? Did you make this choice? Yes or no? Right. Yeah. What Was it a human error? Yes or no? Was it an, an inadvertent thing? You just didn't see it. You weren't conscious of it or whatever. So there's things like that to get the, the, the reporting and the near miss reporting. We've learned from that that you would make the facilities available to everyone so there's no filter from supervisors and so on and so forth. anyone can put one of these things in and i remember when we were um offshore we yeah had yeah a merit and uh, a, de a merit system so in other words going back to the group thing was every near miss that was reported the work group got given a credit that's right 
For every 10 credits, that converted to a merit. For every 10 merits, the company paid for them to have a bonding session in the local pub when they were on the beach. Okay, yeah. As a reward. Yeah. yeah. So, but that then facilitated you just suddenly, you've got all of these near misses and everything being reported. And they're your free lessons, really. Before an incident happens, there's all your signals, your weak signals. Or yes. Signals. Yeah. You know, and I know our audience has heard the the talk about signals. Uh, had a talk about with uh, JC about that. Um, had a talk with Carson about signals. So audience, the concept of signals keeps coming up. That should tell you something that right. you really should be tuning into those. Right. Right. And the safety culture assessment is a signal. Yeah. <laughs> go figure. Yeah. 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 It is a signal. Yeah. And I want to go back again to that um the the fear and blame culture. You know, I, I think that one of the things that have and I guess maybe this is because I come from social work, right? Is like when I when I'm working with people who, are, for example, are alcoholics, right? And somebody has a slip back. You don't go and smash them on the head and, and berate them because they had a misstep. You talk it out and say, okay, well, it happened. We're humans. This is this is what happens, right? What can we learn so that um, if that feeling comes again, you know what supports to get yourself, right? And exactly. I think the same thing in safety is, is that is if you're seeing something is happening, and it's not being picked up on by management and you see your 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 employees have a wealth of knowledge about what really does is coming and being unearthed that could create yeah. a problem exactly but i mean addiction in my experience um and a quite extensive uh, yeah. not me, my father okay yeah then you've got to change the situation. You've got to take them out of the situations they keep going. If you can't do that, then you're gonna it's not gonna work. Okay. Right, exactly. So, yeah. So then you take that principle into safety. Can you change the situation to change the behavior? Can you, you might in, yeah, and it might be uh, changing a manager. Right. It might exactly. like, you know what I mean? Like Yeah, you can change the safety climate of a facility instantly by changing the supervisor or a I think you've got one who doesn't care about safety versus one who does, and you can just switch Absolutely. them about and see like, what happens. I, I remember in a place that I was working, there was a horrific accident where a 17-year-old, his first week on the job, Dom, fell through a fake ceiling oh my because God. the the um, store um, top manager had sent him um, a store clerk, 17-year-old store clerk, and a brand new assistant manager up to clear boxes in a confined space. That manager should be held accountable because that manager had been um, health and safety trained and, and knew that this is a space that nobody should go on top of, right? It was very well instilled with that assessment? upper management. My so is, where's the risk assessment? Where was the well, risk see, assessment? Well, see, these employees Both didn't know about risk assessment though, because they're not educated about that. So. That right. to me is a failure on us that the, we talk to them about ladder safety, right? 20,000 right. times. You don't need to be told how to use a ladder 20,000 times. You know what? Change up the game and what you're educating people and share the knowledge about something like a risk assessment. Like, exactly. you know what I mean? Yeah. And the simple way, there's a thing called Chevron's energy with you go into okay. an area you look for all the energy sources that can get you, whether it's gravity, temperature, chemicals, whatever, motion, yeah, moving equipment and so on. And you look around you, what's going to kill me? And it's really interesting. When you actually go into factories and that, you talk to the guys, my first question is a lot of them, what bit of kit in here is going to kill you? Oh, that. Okay, how do you manage that? Oh, we do this, that and the other. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and you kind of ask, what's going to kill you? Because yeah. that's really, and it kind of brings it to the fore that that's, you know, there's all this stuff. So there's ways and means of doing that. Um, but then, and, and I think this this is now key where we've got the SIF. We've got to the SIFs, yeah. the serious injuries and fatality, okay? That is key. This is where safety falls down. It keeps, I mean, I, I did a paper in 2018 and it showed minor injuries in Britain over the last 32 years. Have, have dropped by 66%. Mm -hmm. Serious injuries and fatalities, 
and there's been a constant 24,000 of them since the 1980s today. Right. So we're, we're tinkering. Everything we're doing is playing with the minor stuff. So now we've got to focus on the serious injuries and fatalities. And right. What we're doing at the EHS is trying to kind of say, based on research and the stuff that we've done, is hey, here's an approach to eliminating serious injuries and fatalities that we know works. Right. That's, yeah. That's yeah. the interesting. Yeah. And again, when we go back and we talked about this interpretive and we talked about this functional approach, we've got something that's implicit versus something that's explicit. Functionalists tend to be explicit. They can measure things, they can prove things, are working or not work. Implicit interpretive approach are opinions by and large. The danger we have today where yeah. we have this safety one debate and this safety two debate and new yeah. view is safety two by and large, not always, but by and large, is opinionate. It's all opinion. There is no hard evidence that you can grab and say. And what's worse is when I did some, some work, I looked at all the CSR reports, corporate sustainability reports, for the companies known to do HOP or safety differently. Yep. And in both cases, I presented at last year's EHS conference, in both cases, they increased the accident rate in the first four or five years. They don't even monitor it. DECA doesn't even monitor it. Get rid of it. It's dehumanizing. But then you're hurting all these people. What's dehumanizing? Hurting people? Or monitoring? Sounds like we need to get you and Decker together to go oh, head to head on it. I think that's what was intended to happen last year, and they all ducked out. But oh. I, did end, I did end up talking with Eric Holnagel, yeah, who's yeah. a really nice guy. He was the guy who kind of put through safety too, but in terms of resilience engineering, and unfortunately, again, no evidence to show that it worked. And all his system variable, by and large, 95% of them anyway, are behaviors. So you right. might as well use organizational behavior management or behavioral safety or BBS or whatever to address those. But unfortunately, and I would like to say to Eric, unfortunately, he's had a stroke this past year. Oh, no. I would really like to send my best wishes to him and his family yeah. um, for that. You know, I, I think that's a real shame. I was hoping to see him in Berlin. But apparently, uh, Carsten's going to be there, and yeah. we all have different views on the new view. Uh, Sydney's going to be there, apparently, doing some kind of workshop. I don't know if he's going to be physically there or if he's going to be electronically there. But yeah. Be there. Now, and what are you talking about? The EHS Congress that's happening in Berlin, September the thirteenth to the fourteenth. Uh -huh. What are you going to be talking about there, Dom? Um, I'm going to try and. Um, pass on a process, a proven process to tackle the SIFs that we know work. Okay. And it's yeah. based on it's based on a lot of research with uh, the construction contractors in Indiana and um, other industries and then data we've collected over the last five years on this um, from various different facilities and industries. And it all works. Yeah. And so if I can say to people, hey guys, here it is, it works. Yeah. Hey, um, and just trying to talk through some of the issues. So in, um, I have a website. It's called peer-leader.com. Okay. Can we put that on the episode page? Can you ping that to me? Yeah, sure. Perfect. But also, Perfect. It's, there's, there's actually a, a PDF on there about uh, practicalities of reducing SIFs. Okay, great. And fatality. So there's so, a resource for our audience. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's great. So make sure that you check that out on Dom's uh, website for sure. Sure. So anything that stops people getting hurt, yeah. that's what this is about. And that's why sometimes people might think I'm a little bit cantankerous about my views on safety. But for me, if we're not doing anything to stop people getting hurt, why are we doing it? Exactly. It, yeah. it's, it's redundant and it's a yeah. waste of resource and time and effort and so on and so forth. And, and you got to be doing stuff that's actually moving the real needle, not exactly. the theoretical needle. Right. And if we can get away from opinions and at yeah. least get some facts and some evidence behind some of this stuff to show that it works, that would be fantastic. Well, but opinions aren't going to keep people from getting hurt. No, but unfortunately, safety has become a huge money making industry. Yeah. For this stuff. Is true. Yeah. And yeah. That's why these messages and cults and the like are appearing. And it is, you know, the new view has very much descended into cultish behavior which is a shame um, well i think that's for another episode 
that we get talking about the new view and safety differently. Yeah, and sure. Do a head off on that. I know that we're at the end of our time now. Yeah. I know it goes fast, Dave, eh? but does, I do want to, <laughs> yeah, I hope we can do this again because it's been fun. Okay. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I yeah, have. I have. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so thank you for everybody who wants to see Dom. He's going to be at the EHS Congress in September, the 13th to the 14th in Berlin. And if you enjoyed our conversation, please like the episode. If you want to hear more, hit subscribe. So thank you, Don, for joining us today. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. And let's hope that in some small way that this conversation has made a difference to somebody somewhere in the world and it saves a life. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take if care. you're looking for more um, safety content, check out saferpedia.com. And until next time, stay safe. Excellent.